So thank you for joining us today again. Uh, this is the second session of the introductory webinar and series entitled uh, Monitoring Aquatic Vegetation with Remote Sensing. Um, my name is Juan Torres Perez, and today, uh, I'm, as, as always, I'm always a, uh, accompanied by my colleague, Amber McCollum, also from the NASA Ames Research Center in California. So as a reminder, here's a, the course uh, structure again and the, and the materials, and, uh, and we went over this during the first session, but it's always good to to uh, remind us again that these are three one one and a half hour sessions that are presented on July 12th, uh, today the 14th, and then on the 19th. And the same content is presented in both in English and Spanish in, in two different times. Uh, so make sure that you just sign up for one of them and attend the one that you prefer. And also, I'd like to remind you that all the webinar recordings, the PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment uh, will be found on the uh, course website that you have here on the screen. And <clears throat> also, as always, if by any chance we're not able to get to your particular question, we will go to the question and answer sessions uh, at the end. Make sure that uh, to send us an email either to myself or to Amber, and we will try to answer it as soon as, soon as possible. Okay, as a reminder also, um, there's a one, one homework assignment uh, to be completed for this course, and that, that will be submitted through uh, Google Forms. The assignment is not gonna be available on the website until the last day of this webinar series, so it's gonna be available on the 19th. And to obtain the certificate of completion, you will need to attend the live uh, webinars and to submit the assignment no later than August the 2nd, which is two weeks after the end of this webinar series. Then eventually you'll be receiving a certificate of completion for the webinar. And also I'd like to remind you that because of the high volume of participants that we typically have on these webinars, it usually takes about two to three months to have these uh, certificates sent out. Uh, but rest assured that if you participated in all three sessions and you submitted the, the homework, you will, you will be receiving the certificate, the certificate eventually. Also keep in mind that this is an introductory course, but uh, we recommend for those uh, who are not familiar with remote sensing, to go over the fundamentals of remote sensing course that we have on our RSET uh, website. Or if you have equivalent experience, uh, that can also count as a prerequisite for this course. And again, all the course materials are available on the website that is shown here on the screen. And eventually, who knows, uh, we may even have uh, another uh, webinar or a more, a more intermediate or advanced uh, level. Okay, let's go over uh, what are the learning objectives for, for this particular session today. Uh, we hope that at the end of the session, you'll be familiarized with the ecology and the importance of a uh, kelp forest, uh, some of the historical and recent uh, remote sensing and in situ techniques that are used to study uh, kelps. And then uh, we're gonna go over two different uh, tools that are available uh, freely available for everyone. One of them is a citizen science tool for mapping the extent of kelp forest, that's called floating forest. And the other one is kelp watch, which is a tool that uses Landsat data to visualize uh, kelp coverage in the in the Western US. And hopefully you, you'll be able to see those and, and, and like them and eventually be able to use them as well. All right, so now let's go uh, through a brief overview of kelp's biology and ecology. Uh, obviously, this is not a comprehensive at all, but the intention is to go over some general information on kelp forests and to pretty much set the ground for uh, the remote sensing discussion that we're going to have further uh, along and during this session. So let's go over some of the general uh, <coughs> biology and ecology of, of, of uh, kelp forests. So in most kelps, the talus or the body consists of uh, flat or leaf-like uh, structures that are known as blades. 
on the blades originate from uh, elongated stem-like structures called the stipes. And the whole fast is a, a root-like uh, structure that anchors the kelp. Uh, 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 plant in quotes um, because they're not really plants uh, to the substrate of the ocean. <clears throat> and um, a lot of uh, the kelp species they also have uh, gas filled bladders or nematoses uh, form at the base of the blades. And these uh, uh, nematoses they aid in the flotation of these blades at or near the water surface. Now, once the individual reaches the surface, it continues to grow horizontally, floating in large masses that uh, restrict the penetration of light through the water column. And, uh, and this eventually limits the growth of other types of submerged aquatic vegetation along the bottom. But we go over that uh, in a moment. Now, as I mentioned in the previous session, despite their appearance, um, kelps, remember that they're algae, they're not plants, they're not real plants, and they are uh, actually brown algae, <clears throat> belong to the class Phyophysi and the older uh, Laminariales. And, but they, they are very important in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the ecology of temperate waters. They hunt because hundreds of marine invertebrates and fishes, they depend on the kelp forest for their survival, their food, and shelter from, from predators. And, and mammals, such as sea otters and seals, can be found within the, within, uh, within the kelp forest. Um, many aquatic bird species also feed on the small fishes and invertebrates that live among the, leap, uh, through, uh, among the blades of the kelp forest at the water surface. Now, some years ago, uh, but um, actually a few years ago in 2018, um, Yayati Lake and Costello, they estimated the global kelp forest coverage to be, to be a little less than 1.5 million uh, square kilometers, only surpassed at that time by the coverage of seagrasses, which is, was estimated to be about 1.6 million. Um, but new estimates that incorporate data, kelp forest data from the Arctic actually now show that kelp uh, on a global basis, uh, the coverage is about 2 million square kilometers, which is about 36% of the world's uh, coastline, making it the largest marine biome in our planet with seagrasses, coral reefs, and mangrove forests following in terms of, the, of their, their, their extension. And, uh, and as I mentioned in the, in the uh, previous, uh, uh, previous session, uh, macrocystis is one of the most dominant genera of kelps, and it forms uh, some of the biggest individuals, uh, with some of them reaching several dozens of meters in length. And also, as I mentioned previously, uh, kelps is one of the fastest growing types of algae uh, some of them can even grow up to about half a meter a day. Now, kelps are, are typical of, of temperate and cold waters and uh, coastlines that are characterized by extensive uh, upwelling, and therefore they're particularly dominant along the some of the western coastlines along the uh, the world. And in fact, they, they thrive in temperatures ranging, ranging for about, from about 6 to 14 uh, centi uh, centigrades, which is about 43 to 6 to 57 uh, Fahrenheit. Their, their geological history dates back to at least the Miocene, uh, about 23 million years ago. And, but unfortunately, recent increases in sea surface temperature and uh, the occurrence of uh, marine heat waves have caused, uh, caused by, by climate change are one of the main drivers of kelp loss around the world. Um, recently, just uh, a few months ago, in May of, of 2022, a paper from Starco et al., they found that in particular, sea surface temperature increases at fine spatial scales uh, and of uh, several degrees can cause the extensive loss of kelps at local scales. And the authors, they also found that zones uh, below the thermocline 
where uh, temperatures remain cool enough can serve even as refugia for uh, a refugia of kelps, but biotic factors, especially the increase in sea urchin populations uh, as a result of the of the heat waves, uh, were dominant, were determinant in restricting the, the, the coverage of kelps. Now, other factors that are also affecting the distribution of, uh, that may affect the distribution of kelps uh, is the, the wave height, the distance from the coast, and other human-related uh, factors, such as uh, eutrophication or increasing nutrients in particular areas, and uh, also mechanical damage caused by humans. Now, hundreds of uh, marine invertebrates and fishes, they depend on the kelp forest for their survival, their food, and shelter from predators. And mammals, such as sea otters and seals, can be found within the kelp forest. And many aquatic birds, uh, as I said, also uh, feed on the small fishes and invertebrates. And, and kelps itself also uh, uh, serve as food uh, to some invertebrates that are living on the seafloor. As it sinks, when it dies, eventually decomposes, and it's also part of, uh, continues to be part of the food web. Now, uh, sea urchins, mainly of the genus Stronghylocentrotus, are one of the main herbivores affecting uh, kelp populations uh, worldwide, and uh, with their populations in turn being affected by heat, wa heat waves, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And, uh, and this promotes their development. Now, other important predators, including even great white sharks and dolphins and orcas, <clears throat> are common inhabitants of the kelp forest, uh, feeding on fishes and other uh, smaller marine mammals as well. And here's a fun fact, and, uh, and you have a photo there of a very cute uh, 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 organism. But sea otters, they wrap themselves in giant kelp fronds to keep them from floating, floating away while they sleep in the other at the, at the water surface. So very, very nice, very cute. Okay, let's then, uh, now with, with, with this short summary on kelp biology and ecology, and I mentioned that it wasn't gonna be comprehensive at all, um, but let's talk about a little bit about how kelp can be discriminated from other benthic or floating vegetation types or components uh, of the water column. Now, before I start, I would definitely like to thank um, Dr. Carl Cabana from UCLA and Tom Bell, uh, previously at UC Santa Barbara, now with the Woods Hole uh, Oceanography Institution, who are experts in, in kelp remote sensing and have been working with kelp uh, for many, many years. And they provided a lot of the content that I am about to present. So thanks, Kyle and Tom, for, for this uh, very valuable contribution to, to RCEP. Now, here's a, here's a graph that shows uh, the absorption of different types of chlorophylls uh, in green and red and blue here in the, in the graph. And, uh, <clears throat> And, and also some carotenes and the yellow, and, uh, and, and we're seeing the, the, the primary y-axis here. And, uh, and see that the characteristic absorption peaks of uh, chlorophylls in the blue and in the, in the red regions, and the absorptions of, of carotenes, for instance, in the blue to, to greenish uh, regions here between about 400 to about 550 or so uh, nanometers. Now, the secondary y-axis here on the, on the right-hand side uh, shows the typical reflectance values of kelps, um, in, in this case, in terms of percentages, with uh, a variation in, man, in the magnitude here in, the, in both uh, uh, spectral curves, um, which uh, most likely the, uh, uh, it's caused uh, by the uh, differences in the concentration of pigments. Now, and I will note how kelp's reflectance peaks show a somewhat inverse uh, relationship with some of the pigment absorption peaks, particularly between the 550 and about 700 uh, nanometers here, with the uh, higher reflectance values uh, within this region, um, as well as a uh, uh, which is particularly what gives the the kelps their characteristic um, the brown dark brown color 
when they are when they're healthy. And uh, and as I referenced here, I've included here some uh, uh, below the graph uh, some lines that are somewhat representative of the range of the Landsat uh, Oli in this in this case. Um, uh, coastal Landsat 8, uh, coastal blue, uh, coastal the blue, the green, and the red bands of this sensor. And but in a moment we're going to talk about the the use of Landsat in particular for kelp monitoring. And one of the one of the, the short demos actually show the use of Landsat uh, for kelp monitoring along the coastline of California. But we'll we'll get into that in a moment. In a moment. All right, so I'll, as kelp uh, blades, they mature, they show the typical dark brown coloration that you see here on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, but as they, the, they senesce, they start to lose coloration and, uh, because of the, uh, as a consequence of losing uh, pigments. And to make things even a bit more complicated from a remote sensing point of view, at least, um, mature and senescent uh, blades, they can be within the same area, obviously, uh, as shown here in the uh, in some aerial photos on the on the left hand side. So this is where uh, spatial resolution, in particular, is uh, takes a role when when you're dealing with with different types of uh, remote sensing images for for analyzing kelp, uh, kelp coverage. Now, here's another uh, important aspect to consider uh, when either planning a field campaign for image validation for kelp analysis or just to simply uh, for when you choose a particular, Im particular image set. Uh, well, the fronds can grow very rapidly. Uh, the typical lifespan of a kelp from is, is only about four months. And on the left uh, graph here, we can see how the chlorophyll content of uh, of a typical kelp from uh, varies through its uh, life cycle. In this case, from about April to uh, to August. And on the right hand here, uh, here we see more precisely how it changes uh, practically on a daily basis. In this case, as uh, as measured by the normalized chlorophyll content. Again, besides things like the presence or absence of clouds and water turbidity, et cetera. These are other factors, more of a biological factors, uh, intrinsic biological factors from the, from the kelp uh, canopy that you need to consider when doing any kind of remote work uh, with kelps and probably with other types of uh, submerged aquatic vegetation species. So, and just the fact that kelp uh, blades uh, float, and that thanks to the presence of nematocysts, as we mentioned, that gives us the advantage of being able to detect to detect it more easily with airborne and satellite-based imagery, maybe than other types of submerged aquatic vegetation that are, uh, as the word implies, uh, underwater. But as, as kelp blades uh, occur at or near the, the surface of the water. Uh, indices that are usually developed for land purposes, like the, let's say, the normalized uh, difference vegetation index or NDVI, can actually be applied to the study of kelps uh, to estimate the health of these uh, magnificent, magnificent organisms. And the graph on the right here shows uh, data from a paper, a recent paper from Schroeder et al., um, where you can see a marked difference here. Um, in the reflectance of, a, of an unsubmerged uh, uh, kelp, uh, kelp, uh, kelp uh, plant <clears throat> versus uh, plants that are uh, sparsely submerged or uh, even even submerged, and particularly check the difference here um, in the in the near infrared region, how 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 big the difference is. And, and this is actually a very good uh, index, uh, particularly when using the, the remote sen remotely sensed image and uh, to, to note that uh, kelps in any given pixel is actually either floating or it's, uh, it's submerged. Now, another index and, uh, such as the 
the floating algal index that was developed by, by Chan Ming Hu in, in 2009 and uh, was presented in the uh, Remote Sensing of the Environment uh, journal, can also be useful to map and analyze the condition of these kelps uh, at the water surface. The, the floating algal index of F or FII um, used in this in this case the red red, red edge uh, region of the spectrum, so around 400 and about, about around 780 and uh, 50 nanometers, and the short wave infrared region about 1200 nanometers. And, uh, and but the, the FIA was specifically developed for for MODIS data, but uh, could also potentially uh, be applied to kelps also, particularly if there's if the extension of the coverage of the of the water surface is is big enough. Now, see that through this presentation, I've been a bit hesitant, and I mentioned it at the beginning, a bit being hesitant to use the word plant in quotes uh, to refer uh, to kelps. Because again, kelps are, not, are actually plant, uh, algae; they're not really real plants. Okay, now let's uh, let's move on to some to see some data that have used multispectral imagery to discriminate kelps uh, canopy from from space. Now the techniques applied to remotely sensed imagery will likely depend on the on diverse factors, including the spatial and spectral resolution, the presence of uh, or absence of uh, sun glint, clouds, uh, whitings caused, caused by waves, and the atmospheric conditions at the time of the of, of image acquisition. And for example, here's some data from Cavana et al. from 2010, and they applied a principal component analysis uh, to the spot five imagery at, at 10, 10 meters uh, spatial resolution from Southern California to delineate some of the canopy cover. And here in the, as we go through the, through the different uh, parts here of the, particularly in the, in the left hand uh, figure, A shows a false color image here uh, after atmospheric and, and geometric and geo, uh, geo referencing. Uh, and and I'm not very correction. I mean, uh, B here shows the resample image uh, with a cloud and land land mask uh, applied. So you see the line in black, and then the different uh, the, the extents of the coverage, uh, cut coverage in the in here in the water. And D and, and C and D here uh, show the cut canopy delineation after applying principal components and image filtering. Uh, respectively. Now the image on the right here shows a close-up of one of their study sites where the green dot that we see within the image represents the location of a diver-based uh, sampling site. Now the spot-based uh, canopy area correlated very highly with uh, with the in situ monitoring canopy data uh, compiled by the in this case by the by the, uh, the uh, CDFG or the California Department of Fish and Game, uh, shown here in the in the left hand figure the, the, the graph, and the authors also showed how indices such as the NDPI again can be used to estimate kelp biomass, as we see here in the in the right hand figure. And, and this shows again the potential for using multispectral imagery um, for kelp monitoring, at least at the canopy level. Now, I mentioned that we mentioned the, the, the study of, of, of Kavana et al. From, uh, using SPOT, but also the Landsat series provides an unprecedented record of uh, multispectral imagery, which is ideal for monitoring um, submerged aquatic vegetation and kelps in particular at diverse uh, temporal scales. And this is uh, kind of a, a brief overview again of what we went over uh, in the in the previous session. Remember that Landsat, the Landsat series typically has a, a 30 meter spatial resolution, uh, the pixel size, has a 16 day uh, revisit cycle, um, and uh, we're considering the, the constraints of cloud cover, et cetera, you can probably get at least one cloud-free image every one to two months, depending on your site, uh, study site, uh, obviously, uh, if the atmospheric conditions uh, allow it. Uh, 
And as I mentioned earlier, we uh, uh, later during the session, we're going to go over the uh, Kelp Watch, which is a new, brand new uh, from this year, online tool uh, developed for, for monitoring kelp uh, using Landsat data. I also want to mention that uh, that uh, Dr. Scavana and, and, and Bell's uh, group they, they used data for, collected for many many years by the the Santa Barbara Coastal Long Term Ecological Research or, or SBCE uh, leader. This was established in in the year 2000, so there's there's at least two decades of of data from from the from the Santa Barbara uh, leader. And um, this is an interdisciplinary program, but the goal of the program is to understand the ecology of the kelp forest ecosystem. And it, and this one in particular, and here's a, there's a website here where you can find more information about the program itself. Um, it focuses on Southern California, particularly uh, a lot of the Southern California bite. And, uh, and they do monthly uh, non-destructive diverse surveys, been collecting them since since 2002, so for, for 20 years now, to moni monitor the canopy or the biomass of the of the kelp canopy. So every month they go to the same sites. They have their the, the specific way, uh, waypoints, um, um, permanent transects there, where they collect this data. And uh, as a reference here, you see a, a small drawing on the on the right hand side of uh, how how one of their transects look like right? they have a they have a permanent one and then perpendicular lines as well to make sure that they cover uh, uh, a lot of area and, uh, and it's particularly useful with, with Landsat data because because it it allows uh, to have uh, validation points at least for several pixels of uh, of, of of those images. Now, one of the most uh, used techniques to analyze uh, kelp canopy data with Landsat and, and similar multispectral data sets is to determine the fractional cover of the kelp canopy inside uh, each pixel using what is known as a multiple end member spectral mixture analysis or MESMA. MESMA was originally developed by Robert et al. in 1998, uh, actually to map chaparral ecosystems in the in Santa Monica in California, so it was developed for land ecosystems. But uh, MESMA can also be applied to kelp canopy. And when, it, when MESMA is applied to kelp canopy, the, the reflectance uh, spectrum of each of pixel is iteratively modeled as a linear combination of one kelp canopy spectral end member and one of 30 different seawater components. And these 30 components, they contain information from Landsat pixels uh, classified as uh, seawater. And the idea is to account for varying spectral qualities uh, due to factors such as sunglint, uh, phytoplankton concentration, and also to, uh, due to uh, suspended sediment particles. Now, the process is, uh, 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 this process is done uh, due to the moderate spatial resolution of Landsat of 30 meters and the high possibility of finding an heterogeneous canopy cover at any given waypoint uh, or within any given pixel. Uh, in the graph here, we see a typical uh, kelp uh, reflectance curve, assuming here in this case, uh, you, see, you, see, you see how the kelps also see the, the, the reflectance of, uh, of seawater. Uh, uh, but the, the kelp one in particular assumes 100% uh, cover of kelps. Now let's see what happens, and we'll keep the same, the same, the same uh, satellite image and the figure. But we'll see what happens with the reflectance, uh, uh, how it changes with variations in in kelps canopy coverage. Here's modeled uh, the, mo the the same curve, but modeled uh, assuming an 85% cover of kelps. Now see how some of the spectral features. Uh, are starting to be lost, mainly in the visible, and also in the and see how the reflectance in the in the near infrared is uh, reduced. Um, this is uh, obviously because of a, a consequence of the absorption of water itself in the uh, in, in the near infrared. 
Now here's with 50% and with 30% um, cut coverage. Now, nonetheless, and uh, and, it, and again, it shows how how it varies, how how the indivisible the 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 curve is, uh, flattens even more, and and then in the near infrared, uh, it's uh, you have an even lower and lower reflectance with uh, with a uh, with a lower percentage of of kelp coverage. But nonetheless, thanks to to this type of studies, um, a linear relationship can be established between kelp canopy cover and uh, and the reflectance in the visible and the near infrared regions of uh, of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And similar to what we saw uh, before with spot, uh, a kelp fraction can also be estimated with Landsat can be correlated with diver collected data, uh, transect data, particularly biomass, um, at least to some extent. We see that there's there's still some variability here, and, uh, and, and as I mentioned, it's uh, uh, so there are different factors here, uh, particularly the uh, the moderate uh, spatial resolution of the of the Landsat pixels. Now, even more and more interestingly, uh, such results can also be compared to climatolo climatological data from, let's say, events. Uh, like the El Nino Southern Oscillation or, or ENSO. As we know, during El Nino events, changes in the circulation affect the, uh, the occurrence of upwelling events uh, along the west coast of, of America, for example. And this brings warmer waters to the coastlines, affecting the growth and therefore the biomass of kelp forests, as shown here uh, in the graph. We see a much uh, lower biomass during El Nino events uh here what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what i'm signaling here versus let's say la nina events uh on the opposite side or during during normal conditions now in 2020 a couple of years ago hamilton et al uh, they they identified kelp canopy using uh ndvi also um, and bin pixels and they in area what they did is that they bin pixels in the area and photos to match the Landsat 30, 30 by 30 meter pixel size, and they use a an, uh, MESMA also to estimate kelps and, uh, and water fractional cover uh, within the pixels, and they found a strong uh, correlation, an uh, R square of almost, almost 0.8 uh, between the Landsat base uh, kelp canopy estimates um, and also verified kelp uh, cover documented by by high resolution uh, aerial photography uh, collected over the years so this is another example more recent example of the use of landsat to uh, uh ndvi to 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 characterize cover canopy uh, kelp cover uh, canopy and, and biomass now i wanted to also briefly mention um that more recently there's been the development of other instruments more that are more, which are more uh, compact, very 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 small, and that could also be used in the in in other platforms uh, such as uh, uh, unmanned aerial systems or UASs or drones. Um, a lot of people are uh, these days are also trying to integrate the use of just color cameras with let's say things like like, like the phantom drones or, or similar ones. Um, obviously, you can fly these at a very, very low altitude and, and obtain a centimeter scale uh, a, a pixel size. Um, these are very useful for, for mapping purposes at, at, very, at local levels. And, uh, and lately, also, there's been devel the development of some uh, multispectral uh, sensors for, for drones, such as a, a Mikasense here, which is a multispectral one with, with five different channels, and also even hyperspectral ones, such as the head wall, the nanospec uh, here. And, uh, and here's some, uh, some, some uh, data from, from Tom Bell that shows that uh, and that uh, even even when you compare the UAS a uh, like fraction 
uh, here again being to the to the Landsat level uh, spatial resolution, you compare it to, to to Landsat data. There's quite a quite a good relationship between them. So so you can potentially combine both uh, satellite based and and uh, and UAS based uh, data for for uh, canopy studies. Uh, and then it will depend on on, on on your particular research question whether you would you like or you prefer to use uh, either or or both of them. All right, so uh, several several different tools have been created, uh, either uh, as citizen science tools or for just easily obtaining estimates of kelp cover through time. Um, for instance. A NASA funded, highly success, successful uh, citizen science tool is known as Floating Forest, where the citizens, any citizen, can help map, map uh, kelp cover along different coastlines. And, and, uh, and we're going to go over Floating Forest in a second, but I want to mention that. Uh, that uh, I communicated with uh, with uh, with Dr. Scavener and Bell, and right now, Flooring Forest is currently undergoing an update. Um, but uh, but let's take a, a quick look at what's currently available. And again, it, uh, the 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 tool is gonna be is gonna, it's gonna have much more features uh, in in the near near future as well. But at least we can we can we can see what we have now. Okay, so like I said, this is a this is a citizen science tool that uh, was developed a few years ago. It's, uh, it was actually funded uh, through the NASA Citizen Science Program, and uh, and it's a it's a very neat tool uh, for that where people can can provide uh, can classify and provide data for uh for 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 for, for kelp forest in particular and uh and, and it includes several parts of around the world several uh sites around the world and uh and let's just take a look at it um uh, this is the main uh web page of uh of uh, floating forest it's actually managed through the the, the suniverse uh, domain and and actually, if you go into Suniverse, and we're not going to go uh, into a lot of details here just because of, of time, but if you go into let's say projects within Suniverse, you'll see that there's a bunch of different projects, a number of different projects. Uh, all of them are citizen science projects related to well, actually, you see here there's 101 right now, uh, including floating forests and anything from arts, biology, climate, history, you name it. So I encourage you. Here, as you can see, uh, some of them are related to to biology, the spy fishing uh, uh, here, and also the seabird watch as well. So uh, yeah, I encourage you to go into Suniverse and, and and take a look at some of those projects. You might be interested in in in, in some of them, and and hopefully also in in flooring forests. So what we'll see here, we're just gonna it, you'll see that it has a. <coughs> An area where it just talks about the importance of kelps, and uh, and also um, some of the things that we discussed earlier uh, during this uh, during during this uh, uh, part, and uh, and then why do we need help and such, and obviously acknowledgments and uh, and uh, for NASA and, and other people that other agencies that have supported it. So let's. Uh, Let's just see some of the features. What you will do is when you go into for, uh, flooring forest uh, for the first time, there's an area, and here's, I'm already locked in here, but uh, but I'll show you. There's a, um, there's a, I, I would be signing out, but I'm not gonna do it today, but, uh, but uh, you will be pretty much creating an account there. Obviously this is free. And then, you will go you will have the opportunity to either go into find urban kelp which is just kelp forests that are uh, at or nearby uh, urban areas in several parts around the world uh, this one is uh, will, uh, what it will show is uh, it will take you to a site where or to a place where you just you're just gonna you're just gonna answer whether you see or not, or you don't see kelps in that particular image that, that, that they're giving you. And then you move on to, on to another image uh, once you submit that data. 
And the other one is, uh, is actually uh, called, uh, for classifying kelps on the, in New Zealand in, in, in particular. And in, uh, this one is a little bit different, and I believe it's right now. It's, uh, it's, it's on the, on their uh, new development. But, uh, but we will take a look at it uh, in a moment. Um, so let's just go, and then, and then when you go into classify here, it will uh, take you to uh, either of them. There's, a, there's actually a collection here uh, uh, where you see the images that have already been classified by other people. And, uh, and just to show you, I wanted to, to see if I could show you some of the data. Here it is. Right now, as of, as of uh, July, there's more than 23,000 volunteers, um, citizen scientists that have been classifying data, almost 1.2 million classifications um, from, <clears throat> from different parts of the world again. And, uh, and, and there's, uh, there's uh, even more, the more uh, statistical uh, statistics here. Here you see they've gone through several uh, uh, iterations of this. Um, we're going. What we're going to see today is uh, what, they, what they have available at the moment, which is finding urban kelp and also classifying kelp on the uh, New Zealand. You see, some of them say 100% complete, some are 50% complete of, of what it's uh, there. But in any case, even if it says, as you'll see, when let's say in the New Zealand one, even if it says 100% complete, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't classify an image from there. It will still give you an image, and you can still do a classification. And uh, and then what it has is that uh, it, there's a, uh, uh, when you go into the collections, you might even find an image that has already been classified by several people. And you can even compare the classifications of, 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 of some of them. So let's just go back um, for a moment here. And let's just go into the fine urban kelp, and I will, I will, uh, I will just tell you uh, uh, as of uh, right now, you will see that a lot of the images that it contains do not necessarily uh, that it, that that are already uploaded uh, don't necessarily contain any kelp data. That is why this is uh, this is uh, the task that is asking you is just to 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 see just to, to mention if there is or, not, or there isn't kelp in this image. For instance, obviously this is an image that it's a it's a land-based uh, image, and uh, and actually a lot of them are from the Landsat Seven. So you'll see that a lot of them have the you know the striping issue of the of, uh, of the Landsat Seven images. This one, for instance, uh, obviously it's from land, so I will just say no, there's no kelp. You can either go here down and talk, and uh, and there you can uh, you can uh, write something down and and eventually get some response back. But let's just say for the for the sake of this, well, we're gonna click here on done. And here's what I told you: there's, there's, you're gonna be you're gonna see a lot of images. Don't get frustrated. It's just that it's, uh, it's the way that the that the, uh, uh, the software is built. But eventually, you might even get an image that has some kelp. This one. Uh, doesn't seem to have to, to show kelp, and uh, and by the way, there's a tutorial that uh, that would also uh, show you how kelps look like or not. And uh, this one is a bad image, so I'm just go ahead and click done. Um, one of the advantages that uh, also the flooring forest has is that, for instance, when you see something like this, um, you can get go here into the metadata, and here is uh, here's the Google Map for that particular uh, waypoint. And it will take you directly to wherever in the world this image is from. Uh, you see here, um, let's just see where we are in, in the planet. Uh, it looks like Tanzania, yes, exactly. See? So not, 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 not only from, from, uh, from the western coast of the US, but also from other parts of the world. Uh, so let's just close this. And like I said, I just wanted to show you that here's a field guide um with info from of kelps and uh um, the, and i should have shown you this before uh when we started but anyway the, the important thing is that uh in the field guide here it will show you how you should be able to see kelps or the or differentiate kelps from other features in the image you'll see that in the in the ocean you'll see the this uh, uh green structures and as the image has already been classified 
and uh, and those are typical uh, uh, typical uh, forms of uh, let's say of, of kelp forest in the somewhere in the uh, in the around the coastline, and uh, this is what I what I what I mentioned. This this one the 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 urban kelp in particular still doesn't have the feature that where you can delineate the kelp forest and then submit that. But uh, but we'll see that in a moment with the with the New Zealand one. So anyway, uh, if you go back here, there's there's a uh, uh, it shows uh, different types of images and for instance how you will how you will uh, see or differentiate waves and beaches. Uh, clouds are you know, obvious features that, that are pretty easy to, to to separate from others, bad or confusing images such as the ones that we just saw, uh, etc. Uh, land, kind of typical to let's say what we're seeing here uh, in this image. So yeah, uh, you have that field guide as a reference there. So let's just go then into the uh, and I have. A, Open in two different tabs here, just for the for the sake of, of saving some time. But uh, but then let's go back and let's try to classify then um, some kelps. Again, uh, uh, this is a uh, this is an, uh, uh, the area. This is in particular from New Zealand. And likewise, if you click here on the uh, on the the, the information tab, the metadata, it will take you to straight to to New Zealand and, and, and Google Maps, and you'll see from where, uh, in particular, this image is from, from where in New Zealand. And here's a, let me zoom out, here's a whole island. And uh, and uh, it seems to be from, from a lake um, in, in New Zealand. Um, just for the sake of this uh, of, of this uh, uh, demo, let's assume that it's not a lake, that it's a, that is a, a C, there's a C component. And I want to show you here, and, and the reason why I'm saying it is because uh, obviously you're not going to find kelps in lakes, but uh, a lot of time people actually confuse them uh, in the images. For instance, what you see here, what I'm showing here with my, with my cursor here, it actually looks very similar to what we just saw in the field guide. If you, we go back to the field guide, see? It's very, very similar. So it could be confusing. It's always wise to go back into the metadata uh, on the, from the, this link that I showed, just to make sure that you are not uh, confusing an area where it's a lake or a river or something, and, um, and instead of uh, of the ocean. But again, for the for the sake of of, uh, of this uh, tutorial, let's just go here and let's say that we want to classify uh, some of it. So what you will you you will try to actually delineate some of it. Um, this, for example, it, it actually gives you the the choice where if you if you're not sure of or you just want to reclassify it again, you can just click on the X here and it will just delete it and you go back again. Let's say that I wasn't really comfortable with, with that and I saw that there's a there's a little bit here. Okay. And if I'm happy with it, I would just click here on done. And it and that uh, that data will be submitted to 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 the to the to the system. So you are actually contributing to it. And there's a it goes into a depuration process where where some experts are uh, make sure that the, that it's actually helps what you are uh, classifying. But yeah, this is, uh, again, let me just uh, uh, delete that one. Uh, this is actually what flooring forest does. And, and like I said, it's, a, it's pretty cool. And, and even if, for instance, when you go back, even when you're submitting this kind of data, but well, just pretty, you know, just kelp, no kelps, no kelps in the image, you are actually contributing to, to uh, as a citizen scientist uh, with some data. So feel free to uh, to go into uh, flooring forest. You will see, for instance, some of the other features that I just wanted to point out very briefly here is just you'll see some of the classifications. And for instance, here's a, what I was uh, uh, mentioning. Let's just see an image that I that it seems to have uh, kelps in this area, right? Very similar to what we what we saw in the field guide. Uh, here's the image, and this is what I was saying. It's, it's supposed to be an image that is already classified, so it's part of the, those, let's say, 100% completed. But 
you will see that there's at least several people that have classified this image in, in different ways. You can even take a look at each of them and see how, let's say, this person managed it to, to, to classify it. And, uh, and you see, you might even see some differences between the, between the, the different classifications. So again, feel free to, to go into Florin Forest, uh, explore the, uh, the tool. And uh, as I said, you will be contributing to, to this uh, particularly neat project that has been going on for some years uh, funded by NASA. So hopefully you enjoyed it and let's continue. Okay, now that we saw uh, floating, uh, floating uh, forest, let's uh, let's see and uh, let's take another quick look at another tool that it's uh, very useful, particularly for obtaining quick data sets on kelp cover through time. Uh, it's called Kelp Watch. It was uh, recently uh it was uh, just recently became available to the public uh, um, some months ago and uh and it was also developed by the same group um so let's let's take a look at this one this one is in, is particularly useful for 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 managers and for you know, for monitoring purposes when they want to when they want to obtain very quickly very easily uh some data about what has been the cover of kelps uh through time and it has, an, in this case, Kelp Watch has uh, data from more than 30 years of, of Landsat uh, imagery. So let's see, let's see Kelp Watch for, for a moment. So the other uh, tool that I wanted to show you was uh, Kelp Watch, as I mentioned um, briefly a moment ago. Um, Kelp Watch. Um, Differences from from floating forest in the sense that floating forest is a citizen science tool for where you actually delineate the extent of of kelps in different parts around the world. In case in the case of kelp watch, what it does is that uh, you will as you, as we'll see in a moment, you will uh, uh, have the opportunity to go into a specific area. In this case, Kelp Watch is only uh, so far; it's only only has data from the western coast of, coast of the U.S. But uh, it, you can go into an area, delineate a, a, either a polygon or a, or a square or anything, and it will give you the amount of data that's available. But it's, this is data uh, collected from from, Landsat, from La, the Landsat series um, that is available. Uh, in terms of kelp coverage from 1984 to the present. And you can even download a, a CSV file with that data and then uh, use it for your own purposes and, and, uh, and analyze it and upload it into Excel, for, for instance, and, and then uh, you can you be able to, to, to use it as a, as a tool for, for, for either managing or, or just monitoring the, the extent of, of kelps uh, through time. And, uh, and and here's a, this is the main web page of uh, of Kelp Watch. Kelp, Kelp Watch, well, I believe, was released this year, so it's a fairly new uh, tool. Uh, also from from the same uh, the same uh, research team of, of Dr. Scavana and Bell, and uh, and it takes you through a little bit of uh, information about kelp forests, the importance of kelp forests. And then obviously, you know, the, the, it's a collaboration between different institutions, Nature Conservancy, UCLA, uh, UC Santa Barbara, Woodsall, and uh, I believe it was also funded by NASA uh, to some extent. And uh, let's go over it. So uh, here's a, this is the the, uh, the home page. It, it actually has a like it's more like a 45 second demo here with no sound, um, but I will not, feel free to go over it. Uh, we're not gonna see it now because it's pretty much what we will do in, in a moment. Um, if you are interested in knowing about the methodology in particular, it takes you here to some introduction and then it goes into the different methods. As you'll see, it has uh, imagery from, uh, from 1984 to the present, from Baja California, Mexico, to uh, the Oregon-Washington state border, or the whole uh, 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 western coastline, 
of, uh, of, of North America, or almost, uh, almost all of it, and uh, data from Landsat 4, 5, 7, and 8, and um, um, probably in the, in the near future, it will also have from Landsat 9. Um, there's uh, it had just some information about the canopy area, how it was uh, how it was measured. Uh, remember Mesma that we talked about Mesma uh, some moments ago uh, in some of the slides. Uh, it talks about Mesma, how it is processed, uh, how they fill some of the gaps, um, seasonal averaging and such, and the different data fields that you will see when you download the data as, as a CVS file, as I mentioned. And eventually, some some references here uh, for uh, <clears throat> just in case if you want to learn much more about the methodology uh, in general. So let's go um, into the into the map. What you'll see, you you go here. You you can either click here on map, and you just go into explore the map. Let's just on, or you can even go into here into visualize scalp coverage. It's the same thing. It will, it will take you to exactly the same page. So I mentioned it only has data. From the from the western coast of the U.S., data from here, and uh, and when you when you uh, when you click here, first in the first icon here, um, it's not showing right now, but it, what it will show you is just a map of the world where specifically where you are located uh, uh, here. Um, here's a legend that shows when you and when we go uh, when we zoom in into a, to a specific area, you'll see. Uh, you see what I'm what I'm uh, what I'm mentioning here, but uh, this is this will mean just for the sake of of going into going through the legend. Let's um, I'm I'm very familiarized with the uh, with the Monterrey area, so let's go into Monterrey here, uh, and this is what I uh, what I was what what you can see in the in the legend here. That the, the, all everything that scalp canopy area is in green in different tones of, of, of green. You see that each of them corresponds to a specific uh, percentage of kelp. Um, the gray areas are unoccupied uh, areas, areas that are potential habitat for kelps, but uh, but they and, and they may have been occupied at some point uh, during the time series, uh, but not necessarily at this moment. Uh, uh, the white spot, white pixels, like uh, for instance this one here or this one here, just cloud cover. And, and here is uh, from from the California uh, <clears throat> uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Department uh, the designated kelp beds uh, areas for management uh, purposes. Okay, so let's just close the legend there. I um, if you're if you're like me, I actually prefer much more just to see the satellite image. Uh, 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 instead of just the, uh, the you know, the, the, the typical map. Uh, so let's just go into the satellite image there. Uh, again, you can zoom in or zoom out. You can move into specific areas where you are of interest. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, it's still only for the western coast of the U.S. Let's just do... Okay, let's just go here. Here's an area that I that I uh, dove uh, uh, before. Uh, well, I, I haven't been there in, in a while, but last year I was there, and uh, and I know that this is a this is a kelp area here, the, uh, very close to the to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So let's just uh, let's see and let's just assume that we wanna we wanna see some information about. Uh, about this uh, area in general and um, how it has behaved over the last 30 plus years it, it gives you the it will give you the uh, um the the uh, the opportunity or of just of drawing a specific polygon or just a, like a, a rectangle uh, you can uh, you can even upload your own geometry if you have a specific area of interest uh, uh, that it's covered by 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 this uh, by this particular tool uh, you can just remove the whatever geometry you put into it, into this. So let's just uh, let's do a, a, a rectangle and let's just do a, a small rectangle. Let's say in this area here. And, uh, you you click once and then when when you are satisfied by uh, with your geometry, just click uh, click it again. And here it is. It shows you the data. You can either choose 
to see this uh, on a yearly basis or a, a, actually as, 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 as frequent as possible. Um, you can filter the years if you're, if you're interested in a specific set of years, specific timeline, or you can see the data in, based in quarters. The different quarters of the year and the top quarters of the year correspond to, let's say, January to March, April, uh, May, and June, and, and so forth. That's that's what it's uh, what it means here by the three uh, quarters. But let's just look at the uh, all the data, and uh, and here's a very neat feature where you you just you and, and you'll see here the the here's some the estimated what you see here is the estimated kill canopy area and the percentage of uh, unoccupied uh, kelp habitat that contains kelps in this particular uh, time step or in, in this particular uh, 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 time. Let's just go and that uh, it actually gives you information about the cloud coverage in the area. Like I said, you know, cloud, cloud varies continuously. So there might be for specific years, there might be uh, uh, different pixels where you just don't have any data at all just because of clouds. Let's just click here on the uh, on the play button as you and you see as it that it changes through time uh, based on, you know, on when it was classified and uh, and how much kelp area was or wasn't there at any specific uh, uh, time. And you see how it varies here the the kelp area, the coverage and if there's cloud coverage, you'll, you'll probably see here that it, uh, that it shows here as a 1% cloud coverage. Um, <clears throat> we don't have that many clouds so in some parts of the year, um, but uh, uh, in, in, in Monterrey, but, but, uh, but, uh, but there'll, be, there'll be some, uh, depending on, on which time of the year. All right, uh, and again, you can go through, through time there. If you're, let's say that we're interested here in the, and then 2011, okay, click play again, and then it will go through that. And uh, um, some of these, you can see that there's, uh, at least in this area, there's been a reduction in the last, um, I would say, eight years or so. Might be, might be related to the heat, some of the heat waves that uh, has passed in the last, in the last year since, uh, because of climate change, something that we mentioned earlier. Let's just hit the pause button here, and here it is you can you can just yeah, uh, <clears throat> reduce it or not. If you wanna download the data, you just click here on the download button. Button it will give you a reference. It's always important to cite the, the uh, where, from where you obtain the data from. And here's some like I said the data fields, uh, the kelp area in square meters, and the, the number of cells. Uh, the, the, the pixels that contain kelps and and, uh, and some other factors. When you click download here, you will have the it will download your data. And uh, let's just for the sake of of this uh, representation, let's just open it. Um, let me move it here so you guys can see it. And here it is. All the data kelp area in, in square meters, like I said, and and uh, from all for all the years, and and cell counts and and so forth. It, they, but they, obviously, this will vary depending on the on your specific uh, on on your specific uh, area of interest. But uh, but that is a uh, that's what you can get from uh, from Kelp Watch. Like I said, it's, it only contains the data from from the uh, western coast of the U.S. so far. Hopefully, in the in the future, they will add data from from other sites around the world. Um, uh, something that I didn't show is that let's say that I that I, uh, I want to change the geometry. Just click here on the remove geometry, and it will pretty much delete the, that one, and you just and you'll be able to explore explore other area uh, as well. All right, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to show with Kelp Watch. Um, I hope it's of interest for for some of you. And uh, and again, it's, it's it's particularly useful for for managing purposes and also for if you just want to have a, a timeline of how kelp have, has behaved uh, in the last thirty plus years in the in the along the western coast of the U.S. All right, let's move on.
All right. Well, now that we saw both uh, tools and we went over some of the studies that, that have been done in the past to characterize uh, kelps uh, on, uh, with, with different data sets. Um, undoubtedly, kelp forests, uh, we know that are one of the most important coastal ecosystems on the planet. And they provide habitat for thousands of uh, species and food services for uh, millions of humans around the world. Um, the capacity of kelps to produce uh, the floating canopies because of the uh, nomatosis that actually, from the remote sensing point of view, presents a great, great advantage because it's a uh, it's a bit easier to monitor the, these with satellite or airborne imagery than other types of submerged aquatic vegetation. And uh, and as we saw in some of the examples, the study cases. Um, the the unique Landsat series data set is ideal for monitoring trends of kelp biomass and, and coverage uh, over diverse uh, time scales, as we also saw in online tools like uh, Flooring Forest and Kelp Watch. They provide opportunities for both for citizen scientists and also for managers to either collaborate or to retrieve data sets collected with uh, remotely sensed imagery. Now, before we go into the question and answer session, I want to remind you of our contact uh, info here from uh, Ambers and myself. And also, to I uh, want to remind you that there's a number of other different uh, webinars on many, many, many different topics on the RSET website. So feel free to uh, go into the website and choose a webinar based on your topic of interest. And also to to take a look at the at the website sites of our both of our sister programs, uh, Develop, which is a capacity building program for for students and recently graduate student, grad students, and also uh, the Servir program, uh, which has different hubs uh, uh, around the world. And also, uh, I would like to remind you to follow us on Twitter. Uh, uh, as well, where you can get uh, more updated on the um, upcoming webinars from our RSET uh, program. So thank you very much for your time again. And uh, let's go then to the question and answer session. OK, let's see. Let's see. We've been getting uh, uh, several very, very interesting um uh questions we're gonna go over them and again if we we're not able because of time to to go over your specific question feel free to send us an email uh, to either amber or myself <clears throat> and uh and our emails are uh in, in the presentation and are also in the question and answers uh document that uh will eventually be posted on the on the website okay so let's uh let's go over some of them um First one says, okay, it says, can you uh, explain further the kelp reflectance and the weight specific uh, absorption graph, uh, specifically the relation between both factors? Yes, of course. Um, the graph there, uh, first I wanna, I wanna uh, clarify that uh, the graph that we showed, uh, it was, uh, it contained, um, the typical typical absorption or reflectance in the case of kelp uh, curves, um, you know, uh, uh, from data from many many years. So not necessarily from a specific individual, but uh, but it's, they're more meant to 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 show the the general characteristics of pigments and uh, in terms of absorption, and also uh, in the kelp reflectance. So what you're seeing in that graph, in specifically the green, and, and, and I'm referring to slide 13 of this uh, presentation, um, the green, the blue, and the uh, dotted uh, red line, those are typical uh, chlorophyll uh, uh, absorption curves from from uh from different types of chlorophylls uh, most likely chlorophyll uh, a or b and, and maybe others um so uh and you see that all three of them they uh they uh, absorb 
within the blue region of the spectrum, so around 440 to 460 nanometers, and, uh, and also in the red region of the spectrum, so uh, beyond 625 or 30 uh, nanometers or so. And then the yellow curve there uh, uh, refers to most likely to carotenoids, which typically they absorb within the blue, a little bit on the on the green region as well, of the of the spectrum, and they have a much more smooth um, smoother uh, curve than the than, than than the chlorophylls in general. And then. Um, in terms of, of, uh, of the relationship between both, uh, remember that whenever, whenever you, what you would expect in the in the in an absorption or reflectance curve, or when you're comparing these, is that when you have a lot of absorption from from any in in, in any uh, at any given wavelength, where you have a big absorption from from uh, either a particular pigment or, or a group of, of pigments, you would expect to see some sort of uh, reduction in the reflectance of the of that uh, of, of the 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 target the organism itself uh, in that specific region and that that is exactly what we saw in that uh, in in that uh, graph when you look, specifically if you look at the let's say between 550 and uh, 700 nanometers or so so between the green and the and the yellow red region of the spectrum you will see that, for instance, uh, there's a there's a just just for, just to take one of them. There's there's two peaks in the green graph. One of them are um, I would say maybe 580 nanometers. The other one and uh, the green line, I mean, but 580 and the other one about 630 or so nanometers. So definitely this is a this is a, a chlorophyll. Uh, curve, and you see uh, somewhat somewhat inverse relationship between that and and exactly at the same wavelength, where uh, in, with the kelp reflectance, where you where you see the the reduction in the reflectance in that area, whereas in in places where there's uh, less absorption by the pigments, so, so right after let's say right after the 580 nanometers, so about 610 or so, you see an increase in the reflectance because there's there's basically very little absorption happening on on that. Thanks, thank you very much, uh, uh, for for bringing it up. And uh, and yes, there was a there was a comment in the and the uh, Q and A that uh, to put the. The names of the the lines in this uh, in in the that what we show here the blues and the green and and, and reds that's where uh, as I mentioned those are they're, they're meant to be representative of of the uh, the Landsat eight uh, only uh, visible bands so yeah in the in the final document uh, I will make sure that that I have at least uh, you know the, the the light blue here is a coastal band the blue. Dark blue is the, the typical blue band of, of Landsat Oli, and then the, the green and the red, uh, specifically, uh, as well the green and, and, and red bands for Landsat Oli. So, so we'll make sure that we we, we capture that in the final uh, in the final PDF. Thanks for for, for the uh, suggestion, definitely. All right, let's go into the question number two then. Uh, number two, can we use NDWI so normalized difference uh, water index uh, as a land mass? I would say that it's probably easier uh, to just use a you know readily, ab readily available land masks uh, uh, that are out there, or just to, to, to uh, usually you can just very easily do one yourself for your particular site, which I would I would think I would tend to think that you, you uh, the, the person knows this site very well. Um, so uh, and and I I added here uh, this is not not necessarily for Lancet, but I added I found a paper that uh, that was recently published last year. I believe it was um, yes last year was published in the remote sensing of the environment. Uh, so it's a very uh, respectful uh, um, uh, peer reviewed um, uh, publication or or, or, or uh, journal. And uh, and and uh, and the paper actually uh, uh, talks about a global landmass. In this case, for for beers, I believe. 
Um, so a little bit uh, coarser resolution, uh, but but definitely very very useful. So I will encourage uh, uh, the person to who made the, the this question to go go to that that specific paper. And, and it, I'm pretty sure it also has references for others that are, that could also be useful for them. Okay, and so slide 24. Um, just to check, the varying coral of colors of lines have been uh, estimated using MEDPA. Yes, I believe that that was the case uh, from from Tom Bell's uh, data and Kyle's data, uh, Carl Cabana's data. Um, although, again, kind of similar to what we saw in the in the graph about the the pigment absorption and the reflectance, these are are, are meant. Uh, for illustrative purposes, uh, 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 at least for, for this presentation only, and 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 we may the uh, the what what we're seeing here in terms of uh, of the magnitude of the uh, in, particularly in the near infrared region may may change from from one side to to another. Uh, so so they're basically meant to show specifically how the the reflectance is diminished in the near infrared region um, above 700 between 700 and uh, uh, 1,000 nanometers, where uh, there's a high influence of the water, as we saw in the in our session in, uh, on Tuesday. So, so um, uh, as the the more the the more reduction of the the less the percentage in, in kelp's cover cover in a particular pixel, the more the higher the percentage in, in of water, and obviously uh, there's going to be a higher absorption in the in the near infrared. Uh, for that specific pixel. Okay, do you recommend any of these sensors over the others? Uh, this is a good question. Um, the as as we always say in in, in 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 many of our webinars, the use of a particular sensor depends on, on many factors. Uh, for instance, the the size of your study site, smaller so study sites may require imagery that has a much much finer uh, spatial scale uh, than on than than larger sites. So, for instance, as an as an example for for some of these some uh, depending on the site, maybe maybe a Landsat type of image with 30, 30 meters uh, pixel size would be more than enough for you. Maybe you require a little bit more. Finer, uh, and maybe Sentinel that has a 10 meters uh, or 10 to 20 meters uh, resolution and might be a little bit better, or you might even require to to use uh, commercial data, uh, which uh, sometimes have a much uh, much finer uh, resolution. But uh, but also uh, remember that uh, another point to consider is that multispectral imagery has the limitation that it only has a, a small number of bands, so the spectral resolution there is also another factor to consider. Uh, specifically, if, if if you're thinking more on, on maybe even separating different uh, taxonomic groups or, or or species to to some level, um, but what I would uh, lastly what I want to mention is that because of its long record, Landsat is a is a is a probably a good starting point. Um, mostly, if you want to if what you what you want is to follow the presence or absence of let's say kelps in this case. Uh, through time, since uh, obviously the Landsat series has been around since the 70s, almost uh, pretty much five decades of, of data there, um, and uh, and uh, and even more more refined data uh, in the last decades or so. So in the and that's what we, this is what we showed in the in the Kelp Watch demo where that has a uh, Landsat data from about 1984 to the present. So very very. Uh, very robust uh, uh, data there, the, the uh, uh, data set. Um, if you want to just monitor the water quality on a, let's say, on a broader scale, maybe using MODIS or BEERS might uh, be sufficient. Um, it will, again, it will all depend on the question, the research question to be answered. And and if you're interested in knowing how to download data from MODIS or BEERS or even processing, do some of the processing of the data, we definitely recommend the training that we did last year uh, with our, with, with my, with my colleagues, uh, Amita Meta and Sean McCartney and myself, uh, on the transition from MODIS to VIRS, and we, we included here the uh, the link to to that specific uh, that uh, that specific uh, 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 webinar that we did uh, uh, during the fall of last year. 
Um, and it has a demo that goes step by step by step on, on how to do those those things. All right. In regards to and um, there's there are uh, several questions uh, several questions uh, about uh, flooring forests in, in general. Uh, and these are some of them. Uh, in regards to the classified questions, we need an account to answer those. Uh, they part of the homework. Finally, what is the purpose of the don and talk? Okay. Uh, so. <clears throat> If if you wanna if you wanna submit uh, your classifications to Florin Forest, yes, you do need a, an account. Like I said, it's free. You just enter your, your email and uh, and your name and such, and 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 and, and you'll have an account there, and uh, and then you can classify as many uh, as many images as you as you like. Um, uh, as I showed. Uh, and uh, particularly with the with the urban forest ones, uh, and since the site is all undergoing uh, reconstruction, uh, 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 don't be disappointed if you don't get any. If you start seeing just images from from anything other than, than kelps, it's just that it, there's a very 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 large data set uh, within uh, Florid Forest, and uh, but eventually you get some. Um, but anyway, in, in Florida Forest, will will give you the option of, uh, of of showing what I mentioned, whether there's kelp or no kelps, or uh, or to in the case of the New Zealand data, to to, to kind of mark the extension of the kelps. You saw that it's super super simple uh, to do, and uh, and 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 this is not part of the homework, and so this is more. There might be a question the homework uh, in regards to floating forest, but very 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 simple. Um, uh, it's just a demo to show the tool and to encourage the audience to uh, to participate in this citizen science uh, project. And you know, any even if it's just an image, you are contributing to the uh, to the success of this project. Um, with the done and talk button, button specifically, um, it, the 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 purpose of it is that. Uh, uh, when you click on it, there's a, there's going to be a comments uh, section there where you can submit a comment or inquiry or whatever uh, on a specific image, and uh, and then um, probably the analysis team of Florin Forest will will take a look at it and, and maybe maybe submit a response or not, depending on, on what the comment is about. Okay, how do I extract the classified? Uh, area from the Suniverse classification from Florida forest, forest. I don't think the citizens can extract the data. This is more for the developers and managers of the tool to uh, to use. Um, what happens a lot with these types of uh, of citizen science projects is that is that the data eventually goes into some sort of depuration process. Um, they make sure that to make sure that uh, that the data submitted by their citizens. Is uh is is actually valuable valuable data. Is data what well, let's say in, in other words that if uh if uh what you're uh, let's say that you have an image and you and you 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 mark the the extension of of kelps, whether that is uh that is uh is actually kelps or not. Uh, it it goes through a process to make sure that it's uh it's, uh, and because you know, it's a valuable data because eventually this goes into into most likely into a machine learning algorithm uh, to uh, to increase the the <coughs> The, the effectiveness of, of, of this type of classification. Um, regarding flooring forests, uh, the training vector data comes similar to the first one, the sending vector data also shared as a web master account? No, I don't think so. Uh, you can always submit a comment, I believe, to their contact account, contact information, and, uh, and find out if, if it's possible or not. If, if, if let's say that you want to use the data for, let's say, for uh, for research or, or something like that, you can communicate with the team. Um, okay, number eight. Uh, can you suggest uh, some papers to go through the, the analysis of the implication of citizen science tool regarding environmental monitoring? Okay, there's a. Uh, I mean. Citizen science has been used for many, many years in in a, in a plethora of of, of 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 different themes. We you saw through with that with the Suniverse in particular. I, I we showed that there are more than 100 different different citizen science projects that are managed oh, uh, by Suniverse. Um, I would say in the case of NASA, a good starting point 
uh, is to go to the NASA Citizen Science website, and we included the website there on the uh, uh, on the document. Uh, this will show uh, which are the projects that are right now being funded through the, through the NASA Citizen Science program. And many of those, when you go into 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 many of those, uh, you will see that they, they, there's a, probably a link to their uh, to their to the project, and uh, and then it will eventually there's an about about the project and such, and uh, and it will uh, it will it will uh, a lot of them also have uh, links to to the papers that they have already published, uh, the, the the researchers themselves. Uh, so this is a good a good starting point, um, particularly for NASA funded citizen science projects. Um, can these tools work with eelgrass beside kelps? Uh, Flooring forests and kelp watch were designed for kelps in particular. Now, uh, having said that, I I, I do want to uh, uh, re-emphasize that our last our previous session was uh, when well, our previous session was mostly dedicated to seagrasses. So, what we showed in our previous session can be applicable to eelgrass, uh, particularly the, the techniques or the, maybe the use of, of uh, um, FDA, NDA, VI, and, and other, other techniques as well. So, please refer back to the to session one, and, uh, and you might find there some, some, uh, uh, some tools that, that, uh, that you can use. Is there... A good example of differences between kelp and algal blooms when visually classifying, I figure they might be quite similar. This is a really good question. And that would depend on the type of algal bloom, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which also depends on the organism causing uh, uh, the coloration, obviously. And, uh, and this will vary from, from depending on the species or the, or the, or the phytoplankton functional types. Uh, in terms of kelp ecology, at least there's we, we already saw that there's extensive geographical data on the sites where there there or kelp has uh, been growing for many many years, and uh, uh, like what we showed with kelp watch. So this is a this is a this at least is, is again a, a good starting point. Uh, those maps can be used for background information when analyzing the the images from 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 those areas. And to define whether what you are seeing in a in a specific image from a from a coastline is whether kelps or, or whether it's something else. Uh, also, I want to mention that depending again depending on the type of algal bloom, the spectral signal from the from the particular pixels may also vary depending on depending on the on the on the species that is that is causing the algal the the bloom or not. And that can also be a, a very good piece of information. For uh, for for uh, when separating both, the side uh, 11 in the side gives us an images that uh, we not only need to correlate with an NDVI calculation, combining the possible results obtained from this manipulation. I would like to know the reliability of the results when compared to what we can obtain with manual with manual corrections. True, it doesn't uh, contain. It only contains true color images uh, with no other type of no, no, no calculation of any other index. Uh, nonetheless, remember that the site flooring forest in, in particular is meant to be uh, a citizen science uh, a tool, to, and it's meant to be for the public to interact with the project and to help at least detect the presence or absence of, of kelps around the coastlines. So therefore, it also works as a as an educational tool for for everyone. But that's a good point, and uh, maybe something to for them to consider in the future. Um, in the example of a uh, of kelp watch uh, in Monterrey, you can see change in the trend of in the area values from 2013. Does this have to do with the change in in the sensor to and from uh, to Oli uh, using the calculations. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I, I uh, as we know from about 2013, 2014, there was a, that's when we, uh, the, there was the, the, because of El Nino and other factors, um, there was a heavy heat wave that affected kelps around the west coast of the US. And I believe this is what we're seeing after those years there that's uh you see that that uh, that, that decrease in kelps in, in that area is, is very significant uh after those years 
and uh, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be with with a change in, in 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 the sensor. I'm curious if there's a reason why this recent marine sodium sun pan champion resolved the lens bands to a finer resolution. Uh, we got a similar question in the last session, and uh, in terms of whether uh, to use a to do pan sharpening or even whether to use a you know the lansa the, the pan chromatic band which is which has a, a, a finer resolution and uh, I know the, the, the pan chromatic band is usually not used uh, for this and particularly if you're looking at pixels a specific uh, 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 or are doing any kind of a uh, uh, index analysis you will need the the bands in the uh, uh, in the visible and uh, probably the near infrared, if it's uh, at the surface, um, yes, the panchromatic band has a much higher resolution, um, but it's it's not used for for these purposes. The main use of of it is to to maybe to fuse it with uh, with other multi-spectral uh, uh, ones, uh, with other bands, but it's 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 uh, typically people people don't use it on its own. Uh, last one, what's the resolution uh, taken for remote sensing of canopy cover? And in, 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 what, in the case of what we showed uh, with, uh, with the spot data that we showed from the earlier papers from, from Kyle Cavana and Tom Bell, those uh, that has a 10 meter uh, spatial resolution. Um, and then in the case of, of Landsat, obviously the resolution is 30 meters. Uh, so what, what you what you will find in, in let's say in Kelp Watch and uh, and in in other of the uh, some other other the recent papers and uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a 30 meter uh, pixel size. Okay. So we are uh, we're already on the at the at the, uh, the end of this uh, session. Uh, again, if you have any other questions, feel free to send us an email. Uh, thank you so much for for participating in the in this second session. Uh, we have one last one that's going to be next week uh, on the 19. That one is mostly dedicated to to sargassum uh, extent. Uh, which is another seaweed, about another brown algae, in this case on the Atlantic and the Caribbean, and, uh, and we'll have invited uh, special uh, speakers and, and, and all. So thank you so much. Have a great day, and we'll see each other and we'll talk to each other then on the next Tuesday on the final session. Have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>